Welcome everyone to um, what I'm sure will be a fascinating talk on Bolivia. Um, ben and I have known each other for a long time, um, a very long time, uh, in fact, and um, there is no one who knows more about Latin America, really, um, as this um, 1924 version of the Latin South American handbook is probably about the only one he didn't write. Uh, <laughs> um, Ben started uh, working on the South American handbook in 1980, I think you told me, Ben, and has been uh, editor for the last 30 years or so. So, as I say, what he doesn't know isn't worth knowing. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a real, real privilege and honor to have Ben here with us today. And what, what's going to happen is I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And then while uh, um, Suffolk Internet decides whether it's going to let Ben share his screen, he'll share his screen and then off we go, off we'll go. So here we go. Thank you very much, Ed, for um, inviting me to give the talk today and for your very kind introduction. Um, I hope everybody is feeling well and keeping safe in these strange times. And I also hope that we will soon be able to visit places like Bolivia. I've drawn a map, well not drawn, presented a map here of um, the country just to show where I'll be talking about and I put arrows on it because the text is rather difficult to read. The blue arrow is where we start in Tarija and the Sinti Valley is the first place I'll talk about. The red arrow is Cochabamba and Toro Toro National Park, the second place that I'll be talking about. And the green arrow points to Potosi because that features to some extent in the talk, um, even if in absentia. So let's, um, oh, hang on. Start with a general view of uh, the landscape around Tarija, um, which as you can see is fairly flat with mountains around and the river the main river for Tarija is called the Guadalquivir. Tarija itself is, as I say, in the far south of Bolivia. Its distance from the judicial, political and commercial hubs of the rest of the country have given it a cultural heritage distinct from much of the rest of Bolivia, and it feels closer to Argentina in a way. It was founded in 1574. It was the first place in the whole of South America de to declare independence from Spain in 1807 and remained independent until joining Bolivia in 1825. This is the main festival for Tarija, the San Roque, which takes place from mid-August to the first week of September. And unlike many South American festivals, um, no alcohol is consumed during it. But um, as most other festivals, there's a lot of um, dancing and religious processions. That one. In, um, until the 1880s, Bolivia owned considerable territory on the Pacific coast of South America, including rich nitrate fields. And this also gave the country an outlet to the sea for foreign trade. Um, but between the mid 1870s, 1880s, the War of the Pacific took place in which Bolivia and Peru fought Chile and lost Bolivia's possessions on the Pacific coast, which meant that Tarija became a major trading center for Bolivian goods to take them out of the country through the Argentine ports. And these two buildings here are the houses of one of the richest of the traders at that time, a fellow, as you say, see, called Moises Navajas. Nowadays, the city owes its prosperity mostly to natural gas, which has been exploited since the 1990s. Because of its almost year-round spring-like climate, Tarika is a great place for fruit and vegetables, particularly grapes. Um, 
the picture on the top right shows the um, the last of the grapes of this year's grape harvest uh, sent to me by a friend, well, sent on Facebook by a friend um, just a few days ago, in fact. In Bolivia, there are over 3,000 hectares of vineyards, 80% of which are in Tarica, which are accounts for over 90% of Bolivia's wine production, about 6 million litres a year. Um, the main grape varieties that are grown are Tanat and Sifa, but the most planted is still one of the original vines, which is a Criolla variety called Moscatel of Alexandria, which is used mostly for producing Singani, which I will tell you about in a minute. Um, there's a story often told about Bolivian wine, which was that in 2013, there was a blind tasting of wines in Montevideo in Uruguay. And the winner was a Bolivian wine. The judges were so flabbergasted that they wouldn't award the prize until they'd been to the vineyard to see it for themselves. And the bottle on the left, the Tanat of Aranjuez, is the wine in question. Um, and I mentioned just now Singani, which is, a, you can see on the right hand of the screen, uh, which is produced by uh, vineyards like Casa Real and Rujero. And it's a clear brandy, much along the same lines as Pisco. Um, a good one can be savoured much the way that a good Chilean or Peruvian Pisco can be savoured. But um, unlike Peruvian or Chilean Pisco sours, the way Bolivians treat Singani for a sort of everyday drink is much less precious. You buy a bottle of Singani and a big bottle of 7-Up and you settle down for the evening with your chums and uh, you drink what they call chufly. And this is a small vineyard outside Tarija in the, the Central Valley, which is the main wine growing area called Casa Vieja, where they still tread the grapes by foot, um, but they have a nice restaurant where we had lunch. But I'm going to head now north of Tarija, if you can remember the map, to the Sinti Valley, which is um, where Wine is produced in a much more artisanal, small-scale way. It's on the fringes of the Altiplano, on the road from Tarija to Potosí. We have to climb 1,900 meters from Tarija up to the Altiplano, which reaches heights of 3,500 meters. And it's in this region that the Sinti Valley is located. The um, vineyards are among the highest in the world, ranging from 2,300 metres to 3,000 metres above sea level, and there are only about 300 hectares of vineyards in the area. Um, as we pass up the road and through villages like the one on the right, El Puente, um, the first vineyard that we reached was called the Casa de La Casa de Barro, the House of Mud. And um, it's designated as a living museum because it is still a producing vineyard with the wines produced in the way that they've always been produced. Uh, as beside vineyards in the open fields, the vines clamber over molie, which are pepper trees and chanya trees which is Palo Verde or Greenwood. From here, we moved on to Villa Abesia, which is a, a sort of a small town um, in the vine, in the vineyard region. And um, here we stopped at the shop of the bodega of Don Tomas. As you can see from the picture on the right, they produce Singani but also, as the picture on the left shows, what they call vino oporto, which is a, a sweet red wine. It's not really like, it's not as sort of heavy as, as port that we know, but it is a sweet red. And I have to confess, 
um, that the, ta the small tasting that we had it wasn't really to my taste, but um, there we go. And this is the landscape of the Sinti Valley, which is mostly a stark contrast between the red of the surrounding hills and mountains and the rich green valleys of the, the river, which flows through the river, the Rio Grande, which flows through most of the valley itself. The next vineyard we stopped at was this one, Cepas de Oro at 2,328 meters above sea level. As Amanda Barnes says, and I believe that um, she will be giving the next talk to this group, there's something quite magical about old vines in Bolivia. Wrapped around large trunks of pink peppercorn trees, the vines crawl up to the height of their host and spread far and high. They intertwine with tree branches and other usurping vines, providing a true field blend, or tree blend if you will, of Criolla, Criolla grape varieties. The existence of these old vines and old viticulture methods give you a hint at the long history of wine in Bolivia. Um, going back to Potosí for a minute, in 1545, the Spaniards founded the city at 3,977 meters above sea level. It's the highest city in the world of comparable size. At the foot of Sumac Orco, or the Cerro Rico, which is the, the rich hill. This single mountain provided the silver which fueled the Spanish Empire, the vast wealth of colonial Spain, and caused the suffering and death of millions of indigenous people and slaves who were forced to sacrifice their lives for their master's greed. I am Rich Potosi, the treasure of the world, the king of the mountains, the envy of kings, says the city's shield, which gives you a pretty good idea of what the Spaniards thought Potosi was for. But what fast became the largest city in the Americas, if not one of the richest in the world, needed supplying with food and drink because the conditions at those altitudes are harsh. The first vineyards in, in Bolivia were planted about 1570. So not long after the founding of Potosi. 1584, the Dom Dominicans, Jesuits and Augustinians settled in the Sinti Valley and found it the best place for grapes, olives and figs for the Potosi market. And while Sinti provided the grapes for the wine, which for, for the mass and for celebrations or whatever, Cochabamba, which we'll head to a bit later, became the breadbasket of Potosi. So from um, this region, um, the wine was carried on firstly men's shoulders and then on donkey by donkeys and mules up to Potosi. By now, um, today, modern roads, it's about 186 kilometers to Potosi, but back then it was a much, much harder journey. Cepas de Oro is owned by the Rivera family who are among those who are reviving old vines and traditional methods to produce vintages which are now recognized as a denominación de origen, like um, the French DOC. And um, Don Jaime on the left is the father. I think his son is now in charge of the vineyard and taking on most of the, the rejuvenation and the marketing. And on the right of the pictures uh, are two guides who took Sarah and me on our trip that day. And we are drinking a Stingani and fruit juice mix, which was delicious. And here you can see some of the wines that Cepas de Oro produce, the wine barrels and a still for distilling Singani. Uh, we head on towards Camargo, which was the, the destination of the trip that day. Um, it's the main, main trading hub of the area. This is a typical picture of the landscape. There are lots of rock paintings and um, strange rock formations, dolmens and things in the area, which unfortunately we didn't have time to visit. Um, and 
several other vineyards which we did visit and um, this was this is a finally the, the museum on the left the Museo Etnoantropologico dei Sinti in Camargo which has a very good display of the wine and the history of the wine production and the types of the varieties of grapes that are grown and on the right just a picture of the central market which is as you can see is quite a modern building and um, a lot of the, the roads that you will see, which are good roads and modern buildings like this, were all legacy of Evo Morales' first time in office when he really started to, or attempted to open up the um, more remote parts of Bolivia to, to modern transport and modern trade. Okay, that's the end of the wine tour. We're now going back in history. Need to look at my notes because there's some dates here. Um, in Bolivia, there is ample evidence of how the earth as we know it has changed over the millennia, of how continents have formed and of the fossils and tracks of the creatures that walked the earth and lived in the oceans before us. In Tarija, we are concentrating on the Pleistocene area, um, era, I beg your pardon, which began about 2.6 million years ago and lasted about 11,700 until 11,700 years ago. The most recent ice age occurred then as glaciers covered huge parts of the planet. It was the time when uh, Homo sapiens first evolved and by the end of the epoch, humans could be found in nearly every part of the planet. It was followed by the current stage called the Holocene Epoch, and as I say at the top there, the Anthropocene, which is our time now, is right at the very top line of the Holocene. Mammals that are familiar to us today, including apes, cattle, deer, rabbits, kangaroos, bears, members of the canine and feline families, could all be found in the Pleistocene. Also crocodiles, lizards, turtles, pythons and other reptiles. In Tarika, there's ample evidence of early horses in uh, fossil finds and you can see on the right there the picture of uh, the development. We lost you for a second Ben, but, but only a few seconds ago. Fine. Okay, well it obviously doesn't like horses so I'll move on. <laughs> there, that's it. Can you see that one? Um, yes. In the museum in Tarika, which the previous picture, the previous slide showed a couple of examples, um, there are three large fossil skeletons. Um, this is of the um, giant ground sloth, the megatherium. There's also a mammoth and a huge ancestor of an armadillo. But these animals were the types of creatures which didn't survive the ice ages and the climatic conditions of the Pleistocene. And so they, these and things like saber-toothed cats, mastodons, all disappeared in that time. Other than a few birds that were classified as dinosaurs, there were no dinosaurs during the Pleistocene epoch. They had become extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period, more than 60 years before, and it's evidence of those that we'll be looking for as we move on from Toro Toro to Cochabamba. Uh, here's a general view of Cochabamba um, from the Cristo de la Concordia statue above the town. The statue is 34.2 meters high or 40.44 with its pedestal. It's 2,840 meters above sea level and it is claimed to be the largest representation of Christ in the world. Cochabamba has a, like Tarika, has a, a nice equable climate. And um, as I said, it was the breadbasket of Potosí and now it is called the breadbasket of Bolivia. And I just put the picture in there to show you how generous they are with the food in Cochabamba a huge plates of food in the South American handbook in the background, just to give you um, an example of the scale of, of things. Anyway, 
we head south from Cochabamba to towards Toro Toro. And the first place that we stopped at was called Tarata, which um, was the birthplace of the independence hero Esteban Arce and two presidents, um, Rene Barrientos in this century and Mariano Melgarejo in the previous century. Uh, I beg your pardon, in the 19th century. And uh, Barrientos was the 20th century, not this century, sorry. And um, if I might just have a brief aside about Mariano Malgarejo, whose head is preserved in a church in Tarata, and it's said to be so horrific and grisly that it's not allowed to be shown to the public. But uh, Melgarejo was one of the worst presidents it's generally held to be of Bolivia. He, he served from 1864 to 71. He personally assassinated his predecessor. He ceded land to Chile and Boliv to Brazil and various other things. But he's also the center of a rather interesting legend called the Black Legend, in which the British ambassador at the time um, was, went to meet the president and was to told to pay his respects to Melgarajo's mistress's naked buttocks. Not surprisingly, he refused. So he was immediately seized, stripped naked, placed on a donkey and made to ride on the donkey backwards around the main plaza of La Paz three times. When Queen Victoria heard about this on his return to Britain, she ordered the gunboats in. But um, when she heard that the at La Paz was uh, high up in the Andes and gunboats couldn't get there. She instead took a pen and drew a line through Bolivia and said on the map and said Bolivia no longer exists. Uh, the legend persisted for quite a long time and um, it's probably largely untrue, but it also probably based on an insult that one of Melgarejo's predecessors gave to a British charge d'affaires called Colonel John Augustus Lloyd. And it was a serious enough, serious enough insult to destroy British Bolivian diplomatic relations from 1853 until the beginning of the 20th century. Some suspect that the legend was the work of Chilean propagandists in 1874, just before the War of the Pacific, to show how uncouth their Bolivian, the Chilean neighbors were in Bolivia. Anyway, back to the road, and um, we are now on the road to Toro Toro. Uh, this is the transport that we took, and the landscape is, um, apart from a few tiny villages, mountain views, all shapes and sizes and colors, ravines, and the broad valley of the Rio Caine. And here we are approaching Toro Toro on the left you can see an incline the road is cobbled which is fine in the dry season but in the wet and also um, at the rivers the road gets very difficult and what is a, normally a four to five hour journey becomes a six seven eight hour journey the incline in the left hand picture that you can see is one side of a hill which leads to the valley in the right hand picture. You can just about make out the town of Toro Toro in the right hand picture, but um, you come down a bit further and you enter the Toro Toro Valley, which is this one side of it. It's what's called a synclinal folding of sedimentary layers forming a U-shaped structure. The distinctive shapes like plates of a stegosaurus's back are known are as hogbacks. The entire valley is 45 kilometers long and 10 kilometers wide. The picture on the left is the other side of the valley from those hogbacks. You can still see the hogbacks, but they aren't as pulled away from the hillside behind. And on the right, you can see the hogbacks again with our two guides, as I say, Jose Perez and Remy van den Berg. Toro Toro is a small town 
in the middle of the valley. It makes no bones about what its prime attraction is, which is dinosaurs. Um, from what I have seen in more recent posts, um, there are many more effigies of dinosaurs around the town. And as one blogger put it in 2019, there is a T-Rex bursting out of every building. On the left, you can see the town, but you can also see a sheet of rock in front of it. You can just about make out some little indentations in it, and those are dinosaur footprints. The rock is in fact a sheet of the hog's back from the, um, on the one side of the valley. And as you can see on the left, the municipality kindly has done a scheme of the footprints that you will see in the region. And on the right is the track of an ankylosaurus or ankylosaur, which is either climbing or descending uh, the rock uh, footprints left in the mud. And um, this is just outside the town, easy walking distance. Um, all the sites where you can find dinosaur footprints and all the other archaeological remains, etc. You have to visit with a guide, a municipal guide. Um, you can't go anywhere without booking up with one of those first. It's a very good system. It works very well. It's not too expensive. Um, and of course, the, the, the tourist money, tourist dollars back into the community. Oop, gone too far. Um, in the same part of the, just outside the town, are these are sauropod footprints with um, a modern sauropod, well, no, one uh, for, for scale. And in the Toro Toro Canyon, picture on the left, which is one of about 10 in the region, um, which are about a thousand meters deep, um, there are many more sauropod footprints. And again, a modern sauropod for scale. And here you can see how the, the how it happens, but um, the sauropod had what they term hands and feet. The sauropod put its hands down first and then the feet trod almost immediately behind. And so the wash, if you like, in the mud from the, um, the footprint merged with the handprint. These are the sort of creatures that uh, you can find footprints of. The top left is the ankylosaurus, the um, top right the sauropods. The seropods will be coming to in a minute. And I couldn't resist the photograph, the picture on the bottom right of um, sauropods stomping on theropods. You can see the scale of the, the, the two different types of creature. These are theropod footprints in a region outside Toro Toro. Again, you can see the prints, imprints in the mud um, crossing what is now rock, but um, at the time was mud. It's tempting to scrabble away at the strata um, to see if you can find more footprints because they, they, these just disappear under, under stone or under a, a layer of rock. But it's forbidden to disrupt any of the surface of the, of the ground. Uh, you have to wait by law for natural erosion to uncover more evidence. But so far, um, there are an estimated 3,500 dinosaur footprints in eight successive strata. There are other dinosaur sites in Bolivia, such as outside Sucre, um, one of them at Cal Orco, where more than 12,000 footprints have been found on one site on a wall of limestone inclined at about 70 degrees about just over a kilometer long, along and about 80 meters high. Um, the, 
I've put this in just to give a rough idea of, of what happened. Um, picture on the left is a river on the um, Amazonian lowlands of Bolivia. Um, and again, it's not really respective, but um, it shows the type of landscape that would have been there when the dinosaurs, when the sauropods and the ankylosaurs were, were walking around. And um, the land has been pushed up and so that terrain that was like on the left is now high up in the mountains. Um, about 1900 to 3700 meters above sea level. When the Gondwana land supercontinent began to shift and split apart and what is now South America drifted westward, it came up against the Nazca tectonic plate, forcing up what was horizontal into the vertical or near vertical slopes that we see now. In the Cretaceous period that we're talking about around Toro Toro, the valley floor was a very long narrow sea which stretched more or less from Venezuela down to Argentina. The footprints were left on the swampy margins of the sea and the rock strata and sediments of Toro Toro provide evidence of all the coastal environments of that period from under the sea and on the land. There are also remains from much later periods, the Paleocene and the Quaternary, and there are marine fossil, oh, no, bigger pardon, marine fossils from much earlier areas, the Ordovician, Devonian, and Permian, for example. In effect, I suppose you could say that Toro Toro is a textbook of the shores of the seas that existed up to 500 million years ago, all now in the middle of the giant landmass that is South America. This, this is a place called Siete Vueltas, which is higher than the dinosaur footprints. And you can see fossils from the seabed from the, these earlier periods, the or Devonian, Permian, or Savidian. And um, they are everywhere at this height. You can see all types of um, shells. There is also another part of the um, the Toro Toro area called the Turtle Graveyard, which is later where a lot of um, fossils of turtles have been found. And now the, finally, we're going to go to a site called Ciudad de Itas, which is about 21 kilometers from Toro Toro. It's at 3,800 meters above sea level, and you pass through many further strange rock formations um, to get to there. On the way you pass rock paintings. I've been unable to determine when these drawings were made. Um, the Ciudad de Itas, which is a, um, a remarkable place of rock formations where water and wind have eroded the the land into strange formations, gullies, and the most spectacular of all is the cathedral at the Ciudad de Itas. And um, this is where the, this whistle-stop tour of two parts of Bolivia will end. And um, if Ed thinks it's suitable, um, there might be a video, a tiny video to end on but also I hope that at some time in the future we can all get together for a glass of Singani or a glass of Bolivian wine when things are back to normal. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you've been able to hear me. If, and um, well, over to Ed. Thank you. <laughs>
There you go. Fantastic little tune. Thanks for that, Ben. On behalf of all of you, I would particularly like to thank Ben. Um, it's always really educational. Whatever, whenever you, you you talk, I remember you gave that lovely talk to us in Henley a few years ago. Uh, I always learn something. Um, I'm I'm desperate now to go to those bits of Bolivia. I've already asked Sue to start uh, investing, uh, 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 putting together, uh, you know, updating the itineraries on our website to make sure that uh, we're close to those areas so they can again be visited. Um, and the wine, of course, is a particular attraction. So um, anyone who'd like to unmute yourselves and show your appreciation to Ben, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.